Big Sam presents raw. I make this for you. Big Sam presents raw. I make this for you. Big Sam presents raw. I make this for you. Big Sam presents raw. I make this for you. 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 Jane, thank you so much for joining. And thank you for much so much for inviting me. Um so I have a lot of African American friends who have been saying don't burden us by making us explain their racist, you know, their experience of racism that is ongoing uh to us right now. Elevate our their voices, but we need we need to all we white folks like me need to take responsibility for waking up. And you've been doing that work for a couple years now. 52. 52. Um so older than you are yep yep barely i'm getting old fast mm -hmm. um oh, you're old i'm 86 and you're old yeah well i have to say watching your videos i fell madly in love with you you are exactly what this moment needs along with so many other uh educators many of whom are of course uh are uh black and brown brothers and sisters so thank you for joining us and I want to invite you and in, indeed supplicate you to be as hard on me or an, as tough on any of us as you like. We need to all wake up and we do have many um wonderful writers and readers in our community who are of color and we encourage all of you to speak up and they ask a question uh and we will relay your questions to Jane. I will. Um Jane, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And let's yeah. get on with it. Let's do it. <laughs> So I don't know what it is. You can't exactly do your infamous or famous uh well well let me let me start let me show you what it is. Thank you. We judge people by our own ignorance and by our own experiential background. And right now, you need to know that my husband died 6 and a half years ago and he had a lovely hairy chest. And I'm looking at your lovely hairy chest and wishing to God you would button that up a little. Done. Now, you see that's one of the things we don't ever think about is how our behaviors, our dress, our language affect other people. And we teach the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. In other words, treat others the way you want to be treated. Now, I know very well that you as a young pale-faced male do not want to be treated the way I as an old pale-faced woman want to be treated. I don't have the right to treat you the way I want to be treated. I have to live by the platinum rule which says do unto others as others would have you do unto them. Treat others not the way you want to be treated but the way they want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And in order to find out how they want to be treated, you have to ask them, you have to listen to the answer and that's a new experience for pale faces. You have to listen to the answer and if what they ask you to do is indecent, illegal or immoral, you have to do it. but that the platinum rule means you have to communicate with other people on their grounds instead of your own i am extremely upset by people who say i treat everybody the way i want to be treated and in the next sentence they'll say to me well i don't dislike black people but i wouldn't want my daughter to marry one and i say wait a minute fool number 1 are you are you telling me and when you keep saying white white what you're white you are not white and neither am i i see the color of my shirt what color is my shirt it's white okay then what can you see where my shirt stops and my skin begins yes is my skin white no no and it never has been and it never will be there are no practically no white people on this earth every person on this earth their bodies produce melanin in re response to the ways the, to their where they live what they eat and how much sunlight you get, they get So this business of black and white is black is evil, white is pure. This is ridiculous. It has only been going on for 500 years. We created human beings created racism. God in my estimation created one race, the human race. Human beings created racism. Anything you create, you can destroy. 
Mm -hmm. could destroy racism in this country in two generations if we decided to. Look here, it only took us three years to get to the moon after John F. Kennedy got, uh, got elected. It has only taken us four, almost four years to take drastic steps backward this, since this person who lives in the president's residence has been in that area. Yeah. We could go, we, are, we have gone backward farther in four, almost four years than we went forward in all the preceding years. You have to realize that. Just a minute. I'm on the, I'm doing an iPad. You'll have to talk. Well, Jane, it's, uh, being very generous. You've been on three interviews already today. Thank you for your time. I know you're getting a lot of calls. That's all right. Did you hear what I just said to you? We did. I did. Okay. It doesn't matter that I've been on three things already this morning. What no. matters is I will do these as often as I can find even one person who is willing to listen and to learn. And the mm. thing you have to know is there is only one race of people on the face of the earth, and that is human beings. We are oh. all members of the whole, we are all homo sapiens, and homo sapiens come in different sizes, shapes, genders, gender orientations, colors, religion, ethnicities, but we are all members of the same race. I want to stop the myth of race because it isn't a myth. A myth mm. is something you make up to explain physical phenomena, phys and natural phenomena. Mm. Lies are what you make up to justify your ignorant behaviors. The myth of race is actually the lie of race, and we made it up about 500 years ago to justify killing people of different color groups in order to make them Christian. And mm. that's what we did when we came to this country. The minute we set foot, we so-called white people, set foot on this land, we started killing the natural inhabitants. And we knew who, which ones to kill because we killed red men and they weren't red. We were ignorant in that area too because they were red only because of the color of their skin. They weren't even red. This is ridiculous. I'm doing a podcast. Call me back. Goodbye. So Jane, let me ask a clarifying question. When you say we're all of one race, you're not, we are. yeah, you're not saying I don't see color. Oh, God, no. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, let me make that perfectly clear. People say to me all the time, I don't see color. It's always a liberal, pale-faced female who comes up to me and says, during a meeting, I don't see color. I'm colorblind. And I say, I knew that before you said it, because if you weren't colorblind, you wouldn't wear that shirt with those pants. Right. And then she gets offended because right. that's a terrible thing to say to her. But it's all right. right for her to say that she doesn't see the largest organ on another person's body. And your skin, inch for inch, is the largest organ on your body. For somebody to say they don't see it is to admit that they, they have trouble communicating with someone of a different color group. So they just have to pretend that they don't see that unfortunate discoloration. Yeah. I want that sentence taken out of your lexicon. Don't ever, ever say to me, when I see people, I don't see people as black or brown or red or yellow. I just see people as people. They never put the word white in that sentence because mm -hmm. it's all right to see white. Yeah, you do an exercise where you invite folks um, in an audience to stand up if they would like the... Yes. I'll let you finish that. I, I, I asked people, the last one I did like that, I was on the stage with this marvelous black woman. And I said to this group at the University of Houston, because somebody had said, well, if they, if they somebody out of the audience said, if they get power, aren't they going, they want, going to want to treat us the way we have treated them? Aren't they going to want to get even with us? I said, well, let's find out. Well, every black person, who's, every person in this room who considers himself black, who wants to get even with all white folks, please stand. Three young black males stood up. And the rest of them looked at him like, well, how crazy are you, fool? I, and the white folks were so, they were so relieved. And they were just, you know, they just relaxed right now. And Angela Davis looked at me like, where are you going with this one? I said, well, now that's nice, isn't it? Now, but let's be honest about this. Well, every black person in this room who wants to get even with one or two white people, please stand up. They all leaped to their feet, yelling and cheering and clapping and high-fiving one another. And white folks then got tense again. I said, see, people, they don't want to get even with all of us. Each one of them wants to get even with one or two of us. Now, if you want to be treated fairly in the future, treat people of other color groups fairly in the present. Behave in such a way that you won't be one of the one or two they want to get even with. And everybody, and I said, does that make sense to you? And all the students of color cheered and applauded, and the white students looked like, oh, shit. 
And I know what they were thinking. Does that mean I have to take that sentence out of my lexicon? Yes. Yes, it does. I don't think people of color want to get even with all of us, other color groups. And by the way, white is a color. It's the absence of all other colors. Black, on the other hand, is the presence of all colors. You put all colors together and you will get black. And mm. that's what we are. We are all members of the same race that evolved in sub-Saharan Africa between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. And those people were black. And mm. they were so brilliant and so creative and so remarkable that they left the area of the equator and over thousands of years managed to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Every person watching this now, right now, if you trace your DNA back far enough, you'll find a percentage of your DNA came from a country in Africa. Get over it. We are all members of the same race. You aren't my brother. You are one of my 30th to 50th cousins. Mm. If you were my brother, you would be dead. All my brothers, my br brothers, practically, with the, with the exception of two. Anyway, you need to realize that we are all 30th to 50th, co 50th cousins. That's a fact, and it's time to get over the myth, you know, the lie of race. Right. Now, one of my, the yeah. managing editor, one of the two at Elephant, Nicole, uh, wrote a letter. She's a person of color, and she wrote uh, an article on Elephant saying she wants her white friends her white would-be allies to be willing to sit in the yuck, to be uncomfortable. And I think that's partially what, why you're in such demand right now. You make people uncomfortable with a sense of love and with fear and with consistence. No, wait, How wait, 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 do, wait, wait, wait. Do not accuse me of using love. Okay. We have misused the word love to the point where it doesn't have any meaning anymore. I love brownie pudding. I absolutely sure. love it, especially with ice cream on top of it. So yeah. here's a really, really dark dessert with a really, really light ice cream on top of it. I love that. But mm. I don't feel the same way about other people as I do about brownie pudding and ice cream. Okay. I want us to stop using the word love in that context. I okay. appreciate, I recognize, I value people as they are not as they act or look more like me. Right. You don't have to look like me for me to appreciate, recognize, and value you. Thank you. Let so how can we, well, I guess my question is, and thank you for that. My question is, how can we be willing to be uncomfortable and actually learn and stop the cyclical generational ignorance? Uh, your quote, I think you have a couple sweatshirts I've seen, but one of them says, Prejudice is uh, an emotional attachment, if I remember, to ignorance. Prejudice as an emotional commitment to commitment. ignorance. So we how can we can please kick us in the rear and help us give up our attachment to ignorance because it's more comfortable? Privilege. You're only, com don't, don't, we got to give up privilege. Okay. Because yeah. that paper was written about white privilege. Number one, there are no white people. And number two, the reason pale faces have the power that we have is because of ignorance and because we educate, we don't educate, we train people to believe in the brightness of whiteness. Mm -hmm. That is the result of bad, bad learning. What we yeah. have to do is self-educate. And the way you self-educate is, here's one of the ways you self-educate yourself and your children. See this map? Yes. Get a picture in your mind of the map that you saw when you were in school and that you would see if you were in school now. Can you see right. Greenland hanging down in the middle of that map like a great big ripe plum? Yes. If you look careful at that, carefully at that map, if you read the legend at the bottom of that map, it says South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. Yeah. Now get a picture of that map again. Is South America nine times no. larger than Greenland? And not in no. fact it isn't, but according to that map, it is. And Emily, that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Emily, Molly, our editors who are, are helping out, we have an article on that showing the different maps and the actual sizes, the accurate sizes is called, do you remember the name of the correct map that well, shows? The Peter's the projection map. map, and here it is. Yes, it's exactly. Like, yes. Thank you. Yes, but you have There's to know that. that. Sidebar. Can, can you, do you have a picture of the regular, the Mercator map? Is there one there in the studio? 
Yeah, the, bl the blog we have has both of them in it. So we're going to put that link in the sidebar. Just look up Peter's projection map, Emily or Molly. Thank you but for that. Put up, put up the Mercator projection map too, so that people can see the difference. Yeah. Because this is a map that is fair to all people. The there it is. Jane, the, the link is in the sidebar. The world isn't even close to what you think it looks like. That's the name of the blog. Okay. The, 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 the areas on the, the land areas on this map are distorted. The shapes are distorted. But the sizes are right. Right. On this map, South America is nine times larger than Greenland. Look at the size of Africa on this map. It stretches forever. But look at the size of Canada on the Mercator wow. projection map. It stretches right. from hell to breakfast, and it's wrong. Canada is only this big. You have to realize that we have been, this is called the miseducation of the American mind. Yeah. The, the Mercator map is. We yeah. need to stop using the Mercator map. Okay. We need to know the history of that map. The Mercator map was drawn by a man who was commissioned by the Pope to make a map that showed the spread of Christianity. And mm -hmm. so on the Mercator map, the countries that have mostly people of other colors other than white on it, uh, those countries are larger. The countries south of what is called the equator are smaller because they are countries without lots of people with no color. Now you mm -hmm. look at the, the equator on the Mercator projection map and you'll find that it's two thirds of the way down the map. So you can't use the Mercator map if you're going to treat, teach Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere because hemi is a prefix that means half. Hmm. The, per, the Mercator projection map doesn't show, doesn't separate the, the, wor the wor world into two equal parts. It separates it into two thirds and one third. So right. you can either give up hemi Quit calling them hemisphere or agree that you are miseducating the American mind. You are cre creating cognitive dissonance in children from the time they enter kindergarten. You hand a kid a box of crayons yeah. and you say, this is the white crayon. And every kid will put that against their skin because obviously they're white. And you have them put that crayon against your skin. Now, is your skin white, Sonny? Right. And they're all going to say, no. Then you yeah. say, from now on, we aren't going to refer to people as white and black. We're going to refer to people at people at, by their color group. Yes, right. but not white because there are no white people. We are mm -hmm. all shades of brown, very, very light brown or very, very dark brown. And we need to realize that. Thank you. Now, now there are a whole lot of black people who are going to say, I want to give up being called black. Fine, but I want to give up being called white. I'll mm -hmm. call you whatever you want me to as long as you don't want me to be called white and as long as a white person doesn't expect me to refer to that person as white. We are all shades of brown. And in the Bible, which we all profess to believe in, it says that Jesus had kinky woolly hair and feet of bronze. Mm. Now, we white folks, so-called white folks, have changed Jesus into someone we can relate to. Right. And we turn Jesus into a pale-skinned man yeah. with indeterminate eye color because we don't want to admit we, that we all came from and were taught a religion. We came from people who were very, very dark skin and we were taught our religion. We learned religion about a man who had bronze feet and woolly hair. Yeah, we uh, turned him into looking like he was Irish or something like red hair and blue eyes or green eyes. No, 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 no. He doesn't look Irish because you mm. <laughs> we won't wait. Hey, hey. Homo sapiens, once Homo sapiens appeared on the earth, all of Java man, all of Peking man, and all of Neanderthal man practically disappeared from the earth. You can always tell a Neanderthal. There are several, lots of us. All of us have some Neanderthal in us. But you can tell those who have a lot more Neanderthal, they are, they have, they are inclined to abdominal fat, they are bullish and bullying, and they have orange hair. Hmm. Now, do you know anyone who looks like that? Does a picture of someone come to your mind? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one okay, one person okay. in particular right now. Okay. <laughs> which, may be, which may be the reason he behaves the way he does. Because he is more Neanderthal than he is Homo sapien. Right. And if that's the way it is, then there's nothing you can do about it except try to educate him. Right. I'm, you know, these people who uh, believe in the lie of racism and race aren't stupid. You can't fix stupid. You can fix ignorant, and you fix ignorant with education. I'm an educator. Yeah. The word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, 
the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. That's mm. what education ought to do. And if it had been doing that all these years, we wouldn't have a racism problem in this country because we wouldn't have any racists. We would see we would be seeing everybody as our 30th to 50th cousin and deserving of every right that light skinned people have. And that's why you say two generations, that if all of us taught our children uh, that we are all equal, that we all... No, 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 no. I didn't say we're all equal. I'm okay. not equal to you and I never will be. I'll never okay. be as young as you are. I'll never be as tall as you are. I'll never know what you want, know, know about doing your job. I'll never know what you know about being a male. Okay. We are all guaranteed equitable treatment, equal treatment under the law, but we are not all equal. We are equal only in the eyes of God. I guess you that's what I, I mean. By e Let me clarify. I guess that's what, and please change my mind, but that we're fundamentally decent, good human beings deserving of equal rights. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are we yeah. fundamentally good human beings? A whole lot of people will not see us who are the major killers of the world have been in order to get where we are, in yeah. order to maintain our power. That isn't being good. That's being no. powerful. But it doesn't necessarily that's what I, think good. I, no, I think no, just I, from I, the so I can't on yeah. I, you can judge a person by my my father would say every week. <laughs> a man is judged by the company he keeps and the best of companies none too good. Now think about that. And yeah. I look at I look at the man who's in the president's residence and the kind of company he keeps. That's scary. We judge people by the way they behave. We don't automatically assume that everyone is good. He may, they may be good in yeah. the eyes of God, but they may no. not be good for the community, Agreed. for their family, for the state, or for the country. I guess that's what I mean in the eyes of God. I come from the Buddhist tradition. My parents were hippies. My mom was a teacher, and she taught the uh, Peter's projection map in her school. Um, if I so, could turn this off, I would. Please, just, just put the basic goodness the in the side part, and it's, I think we're on the same page. God, God views us as good, but our actions are often selfish and confused and um, ignorant. Kind of topic. Yeah, but the, or the word that your mother, I'm sure, was thinking of is ignorant. We aren't yeah. stupid, we're ignorant, and you cure ignorance with education, which is what your mother did for you, which is what Buddhists do for all of us, if we would just listen to them. But, mm. but Christianity is very different from other religions in many, many ways. We, we're a, we're a different breed, breed of cat. There's no doubt about it. And mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a Christian, a practicing Christian. I'm going to keep on practicing till I get it right. But I don't have right. it right yet. I'm working on it. Right. Well, thank you for that. So um, there seem to be many illusions or confusions that I have, and I I was raised properly by my mom to um hopefully not be racist but we all have we all have assumed racism right not just overt racism but uh, assumptions that what what can we let go of or what can we see in ourselves that we don't want to how can we how can we wake up more we need to assume that most of what we learned in social studies class was wrong mm. Because right. in social studies class, starting in kindergarten, you learn about the rightness of whiteness. You learn about the fact that we are quite certain that white men did all the discovering, all the inventing, all the, they did it all. No white women had anything to do with it, except maybe three or four. But on right. the, for the most part, you learned about the goodness and the brilliance of white people. Well, Columbus Day is one of the most blatant examples of that. We think we discovered, we white people think we discovered an entire continent. Yeah, yeah. well, well, but Thor Heyerdahl told us you, right. Columbus didn't discover America. You can't discover the place where people are already living. They discovered it before you got there. Exactly. We, are, we do not want to give up the myth of the greatness of Christopher Columbus. He captured uh, several members of the Arawak tribe, which is what he found when he came to these lists, to the two where he came to, and he took them back and showed them to the Pope. And the Pope said, these creatures aren't Christians, so they must, they must not be human. They mm. kept them in that land and Christianized them and took them back and showed them to the Pope three or four years later. And he said, oh, these creatures have become Christianized. Therefore, they must be human. And he granted human status 
to the Arawak people because he said they're human. Now, I happen to think they were human before the Pope said so. Mm -hmm. And I happen to think the Japanese were human before we bombed Pearl Harbor with two mm -hmm. atomic bombs. And I happen to think the Germans were human, but they didn't kill. We did, they killed 10 million people during the Second World War. We didn't drop an atomic bomb on them. Right. We dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. Because right. at that time, we had been led to believe that they are, and I remember the vocabulary because I was eight years old when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. We called them the most ridiculous, ugly, discriminating, destructive ways, that, words that you could possibly say. And it's only been in the last few years that we realized that we were lied to there too. Yes, they bombed Pearl Harbor, but we forgot about the history before that. Yeah, and we intern them here in, in our own camps. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're now, we're, if you think, you see, what, what's happening right now is very reminiscent for me of what happened during pre-Second World War. The way this man is talking, it's the way the Hitler talked. It, it's mm -hmm. exactly the kinds of views, the kinds of language, and the kinds of principles that he has came right out of the writings of Adolf Hitler. And if you mm -hmm. don't believe that, then you need to get the book when at times the mob is swayed by Bert Newborn. Everybody okay. needs to read that book because it tells in that book that his second wife, his, yeah, his second wife said that he has in his bedside table a locked drawer in which he has a book that contains the writings of Adolf Hitler. Now, when I have thought about, oh my God, this is Hitlerian for the last three and a half years, I didn't realize that I was seeing what was really happening until I read that book. You need to realize that we are being led by a person who believes in a dictatorship and he would like to be the dictator. Yep. You have to understand that. Now, I yep. know if, look people, don't sell, send me angry letters saying I'm right, wrong about that. Read the book and look yep. at history. And remember that I remember because it happened when I was born. Be the book, was born the same year the book is When at Times the Mob is Swayed. When at Times the Mob, M-O-B, is Swayed. S-W-A-Y-E-D. You need and to read that book. I was so, born the same year that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt came to power. I saw all these things happen. I watched my father just agonize over what was going on. And then came the Second World War, and we were taught to hate Japanese people because they attacked Pearl Harbor. <laughs> yeah. They attacked Pearl Harbor in retaliation for what we had done to their country for years. Yeah. On the other hand, Germany killed 10 million people. We didn't drop bombs on them. They look like us. I want to ask uh, folks, particularly now um, when Amazon is making billions of dollars to support your local independent and possibly black owned books, bookshops, please take that Amazon link out. I know it's well intentioned. Goodreads um, may have been bought by Amazon too. Let's support our local communities and particularly people of color uh, bookshops. If you can, please. Um, it, isn't just, it, isn't just, it isn't just bookshops. Amazon no. is destroying mom and pop businesses all over the United States of America yeah. because they have the power to do it and they have the permission to do it. And what we have is a monopoly there and monopolies are against the law. But they yeah. aren't against the law as long as the members of the business roundtable, who are cohorts of our so-called president, continue to do the kinds of things that Amazon is doing. We have to break up these people who are monopolizing what you yeah. can buy, what you can sell, what you can read, what you can think, what you can hear, and what you can watch on television. Now, I have so, no problem with people making money as long as they are will allow others to make yeah. money too. Amen. So a lot of people want to buy that. Uh, a lot of people want to buy that book right now. Let's get a Powell's link. Powell's is a wonderful independent. There's also Abe books. Let's put those links in there. And Emily and Molly, please watch. I know you're looking for links, but some people have been asking about um, Jane's work. Let's put the link to her work in here. Yeah. Oh, another book. Get this book, The Color of Law. And okay. read, if you don't read the whole thing, just read, there are two pages in here that everybody has to read. I don't remember what they are right now, but this book will tell you that the, law, the laws we have in this country that cause, that cause segregation are the result of people who had never 
heard of the fact that there's more than one race. Mm. Laws in this country have been written by people who were indoctrinated with the lie of race. And so mm. we make laws, lawyers make laws, mm. laws out of what they know. Teachers yep. teach subjects out of what they know. Yeah. They don't know any better, and you can't right. teach what you don't know. You read this book, and you will realize how many of our laws are deliberately constructed to come to cut to protect and promote the status quo. They are they. Uh, we have segregation in cities, and people say it's de facto segregation. Those people just want to live with people who are like themselves. No, we have de jure segregation, which is caused by the people who write the laws that force you to be segregated. If yeah, you don't know that, you need to read this book, people. If you want to solve the problem of racism, you self-educate. You cannot yeah. expect your teachers, your preachers, your ministers, your priests, your rabbis, even, even your Buddhist leaders, you can't expect them to educate you. You can expect them to indoctrinate you into their beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's time for us to self-educate. You read this, and then a quick and easy way to get an education, a really easy way. And whoopsie, there goes my telephone. Well, the, the battery fell out, so I don't have to worry about that. Get we have you all day. <laughs> get this magazine. Okay. National Geographic for April of 2018. 2018. Okay. Get this magazine and read it. It will blow you away. These two girls are twins. These are twin girls. Wow. Both humans. Both their parents yes. had human parents. Neither of their parents came from outer space. Get this magazine and then turn to this page. Where is this page? Just a minute now. Uh, if I'm going to get there. This is a map of the world, which shows where people started and how they moved from there mm. to populate land masses all over the world without wow. the benefit of any modern technology. Those black people did that and and as they got farther and farther from the equator, their bodies were in response to the natural environment. They changed shape and color, but they didn't change their level of intelligence. They were able to do that without any what we call so-called white people telling them how to do it. I right. want to know how you justify calling. And yesterday and day before yesterday, the day before that, I watched all these lovely people on television describing what was happening in all these cities. And they're saying all these multiracial groups. I want to shake the television because those are not multiracial groups. Mm. They are groups of multicolors, many colors, many ethnicities, many religions, maybe many genders, many gender orientations, but they are not groups of many races. They're all human beings, one race, homo sapiens. Thank you. In anger, because we have been taught to believe that there are several different races and the white race is the best. It's absolutely un-American. It's unintelligent. It's, you can't do it. You have, we have to put a stop to this. And we are in, you know, this week, we better put a stop to it soon because the demographics of this country say that by, within 30 years, within 30 years, white people will have become a numerical minority on mm -hmm. this land, on, in the world, but certainly in the United States. And that's one of the reasons why white males are so upset right now. Exactly. They know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They know that as that white woman said, aren't they going to want to treat us the way we've treated them? Yet, if you're worried about the way you're going to be treated in the future by people of color, treat them fairly in the present and realize that you are one of them. If you're a human being on the face of the earth, you are a member of the race that was started between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. And it wasn't the white race because we couldn't have survived. White people couldn't have survived in Africa at that time no. without clothing and without housing. But they did because they were brilliant and they still are. But we yeah. don't realize it because we have been taught to think of them as less than. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. The alcoholics say insanity means doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. That's what we've been doing in this country for 500, 300 years, for sure. We've been doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting different results. You can't do it. You have to change your behaviors because you won't change the situation until you change your behaviors. Amen. So, yeah, I was... You've got to stop saying amen and say a women. A women. You got it.
I know I'm going to, I'm going to get really nasty comments on that. And do I care? No. Oh yeah. What's your question? No, it's about time uh, mediocre white men like myself listen for a change. Well, I'm not sure you're I'm a not, mediocre, and well, I know you're not white. Right, exactly. Thank you're you. An average, you're an average light-skinned male, but you're thank not you. a mediocre white man. Thank you. That makes sense to you? Yes, thank you. And, and you need to remember that in or, order, male is what we call men. In order to make a word that talks about women, we added the chemical symbol for iron to the word male to get female fe is the chemical symbol for iron so you add iron to that other group and you got something new and different and, strong, you. and strong because we yeah. will outlive you most of the men watching this will die 20 or more years before their wives will and i know that because mine did and i'm really angry Really, anyway, um, okay, now I turn into a soup sandwich. No, go. What's your next question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess my next question is what I was watching this video by Martin Luther King Jr. talking about riots as the language of the unheard. And on some level, these protests feel wonderful. They feel like needed and we need, we need to wake up. And otherwise, we're just going to, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was talking about what we're going through now, like 60 years ago, and uh, we have to stop, you know. Frederick Douglass talked about it before Martin Luther King Jr. did. Frederick right. Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Right. Find out what any people will quietly submit to, and you will have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. Those yeah. who profess to favor freedom and yet deprecate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Exactly. What, what those people did this week, you could have learned, you could have expected if you would study what Frederick Douglass said. And that was a long time before Martin Luther King Jr., well, according to our president, uh, Frederick Douglass is, is alive. You remember that? Oh, yes, he says he's talking to Frederick Douglass. It's like when he went to Puerto Rico and he said, uh, he called Port the person in Puerto Rico and he said, I've talked to your president. And she said, uh, Mr. Trump, you are our president. Right. Not in his view. We are, we are talking about ignorance here. Ignorance at the highest level. Our commander in chief, ignorant in the extreme and we need to realize that and not allow that to continue for four more years we must not allow this to happen jane in our remaining minutes can you tell us a little bit about that time with martin luther king jr i know you loved him and how your work started with your students yeah i will but i don't want to because every time i think about that I, I do turn into a soup sandwich because that was a, i watched my little sister die when i was 10 and she was three and I watched my father more than that, and I thought that was the worst thing that could happen to me. Right. And then Martin Luther King Jr. was killed. And he had, for me, he represented hope. And for me, hope is an acronym for hanging, holding on to positive energy. And that's what mm. he did. Mm. He was one of our heroes of the month in February in my third grade classroom, along with George Washington, who owned slaves, bought and sold people for money. Mm. Abraham Lincoln, who refused to free the slaves until he absolutely had to. Daniel Boone, who was famous for killing, taking Native American land and use, calling it his own. And Davy Crockett, who was killed as he killed, tried to kill Mexicans as we tried to take over part of their land. Right. And those were our heroes of the month in February, along right. with Martin Luther King Jr. That was racist teaching, but I wouldn't have agreed that it was racist teaching because I swore that I would never act like a racist. But I was because I didn't recognize what a racist looked like. And what a racist right. looked like looks like is somebody who used the Mercator Projection map and who teaches that Columbus discovered America. I was, we were studying the Indian unit at that time because kids get real antsy in the springtime and they want to get out of the, uh, get out of the room. So you teach them something and you, you involve them in something that's interesting. And what was interesting was Native Americans. We called them Indians because that's what Christopher, that's what uh, Christopher Columbus called them. Come on, they weren't, right. they weren't we, he, he hadn't reached India. But he didn't, couldn't think of another word. Okay, so 
we were studying the Indian unit. We were going to put up the teepee that my previous year's third graders had made the next day, and we were going to paint it with Indian symbols chosen by white folks, read Indian poetry written by white folks, sing Indian songs written by white folks, and learn the Sioux Indian prayer that says, Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins, which was taught to the Indians by a white minister, missionary. So I had the teepee under my arm. I walked into my front door. The telephone was ringing. I answered it. It was my sister. She said, Jane, is the, do you have the television on? No. You better turn it on. Why? Because they shot him. And I said, who we shoot this time? Because we were in a shooting mood. We shot anybody who disagreed with us or who said there's a, a better way. And then she said, Martin Luther King Jr. And for a moment, the world stopped turning for me. That was, that was one of the, that was a horrible, terrible disaster because he was trying to make the world, the country, a better place for everybody, not just for black people. I was just sick. And so I turned on the television. I fed the kids. I got them to bed. I washed and dried the TV. I laid it out on the living room floor. I was ironing it. And Walter Cronkite came on and he was talking to three leaders of the black community. And he said to those three black males, when our leader was killed, his widow held us together. Who's going to keep your people in line? In line? And I thought, oh my God, it's us and them. If Walter Cronkite thinks that way, oh my God. So I changed the channel. And there was Dan Rather saying to three leaders of the black community, don't you Negroes think you should feel sympathy for us white people because we can't feel the anger at this killing that you Negroes can. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I rolled up the teepee. I threw it into the closet. I got my husband husband's supper writing because he worked nights at Oliver, the Oliver tractor plant at that time. And I decided at that point that the next day, not only was I going to teach my children that Sioux Indian prayer, I was going to arrange to have it answered for them because mm -hmm. I was going to do what we do in this society. I to walk a mile in a, the I, quote, I walk a mile. Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I've walked a mile in his moccasins. I was going to do what we do in this society. I was going to pick out a group of people on the basis of a physical characteristic over which they had absolutely no control. I was going to assign characteristics to them, either positive or negative, depending on that, that particular char physical characteristic. I was going to treat them as though all the negative things and the positive things I was saying about them were absolutely true. Mm -hmm. I was going to force one group to live down to my expectations of them. I was going to for force the other group, encourage the other group to live up to my expectations of them. And I was going to let them find out how it feels to be treated that way 24-7 in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Right. Where we have liberty and justice for all, right. which we don't. No. I didn't know how this would work. If I had known how it would work, I probably wouldn't have done it. If I had known that my children were going to be beaten, spit on, that they were, their belongings were going to be destroyed, that they were going to be mentally and physically abused by their peers, by their teachers, and by the parents of their peers, because they had, well, to this day, for 20% of the people in that community, an N-word lover for a mother. If I had known that was going to happen, I wouldn't have done the exercise. If I had known that no people, no, that my parents would lose their business, they had, a, they had a restaurant in a little hotel that we owned. By the, the day before the, I did the exercise, they sold a whole bunch of food. The day after it, they sold none. Wow. People would not eat in the restaurant that was owned by the people who raised the town's only N-word lover. If I had known that no teacher would speak to me for 12 years in that system after I did that exercise, because I had... I made them look at themselves in a new way. If I'd known that was going to happen, I probably would have done it sooner because I found out I had a whole lot more time to teach when I was no longer included in their hall conferences and my internal environment was a lot less polluted when I no longer had to listen to their racist, sexist, homophobic, ethnocentric statements, but I didn't know. <laughs> so that night when I went to bed, I said the only prayer I was saying at that time, oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Oh Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace, oh God. I said it over and over like a mantra. I learned something really valuable from the following weeks and the following years. Be careful what you pray for. Mm -hmm. You might get it. Mm -hmm. And you might find out that was exactly what you did not want. I wanted to be accepted in that community. I wanted my father to understand what I was doing and to support me for it and re reinforce it. I, I wanted my mother to do the same thing. My father did. My mother, after my father died, my father kicked me out of the family. 
and said, don't come over here anymore. Nobody's comfortable when you're around. When she did that blue-eyed, brown-eyed thing, you had ruined our reputation in this community. Well, I felt bad about that for about half an hour. And I thought, you fool, there are only a thousand people in that community and only 20% of them are as ignorant as your mother. Get over mm. it. Mm. So that didn't bother me. After that, that didn't bother me anymore. And it made my husband really happy because he didn't have to be around her anymore. So there were, you know, there were some real positives to these negatives. Right. But I went into my classroom the next day and I separated my students according to the color of their eyes. And I was shocked at how quick, quickly they became what I told them they were. I will right. never forget little brown-eyed Debbie when I said blue-eyed people aren't as smart as brown-eyed people. They aren't as clean as brown-eyed people. They aren't as civilized as brown-eyed people. And little brown-eyed Debbie sitting, and I have blue eyes, little brown-eyed Debbie sitting in the front row looked up at me and said, how come you're the teacher here if you've got them blue eyes? Mm. That quickly, that kid knew how to attack the color of my eyes and the words to use to put me in my place. Mm. I thought what my third graders did that day was absolutely awful, what they did to one another, what the brown-eyed people were willing to do to the blue-eyed people and what the blue-eyed people had to do and had to take it. I thought it was just childish reactions. I went down to the teacher's lounge at noon. I was, in, I was feeling really bad. Some horrible things were happening in my classroom. Kids were treating each other in a very in an absolutely unloving way. And I went into the teacher's lounge. There were about 10 teachers in the teacher's lounge. The other two, the other two third grade teachers were in there. One of them was probably maybe 54 at the time, and the other was over 60. They had been molding young minds for many years, and I told them what was happening in my classroom. When I finished telling them what was happening, the younger of those two teachers said, I don't know how you have time for all that extra stuff. It's all I can teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, she hadn't taught reading, writing, and arithmetic yet. She might as well have done the extra stuff. And the other one, over 60 years old, molding young minds for over 30 years. And she said to me, on the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, I don't know why you're doing that. I thought it was about time somebody shot that son of a bitch. Yeah. No teacher shook her head. No teacher gasped. Nobody said, Helen, do you realize what you've just said? Yeah. Every one of those so-called educated educators smiled and nodded because she had expressed their feelings perfectly. And the oldest member, as the oldest member of the group, she had the most right to do so. I went back to my classroom determined that no student of any age will ever leave my presence with those attitudes unchallenged. I may not be able to change your attitude, but I can challenge your attitude. And you have to prove to me that white people are superior, so-called white people are superior to everybody else on the face of the earth. And you can't do it because it isn't true. Right. We've got to realize that we do not talk about the inventions, the creations that people of color have created in this country. And when I pull up to a stoplight in Osage, Iowa, and there I am in my car, a little old white, white, so-called white, little old woman, and I look up at the trucker in his big old semi, and he's because he's in a hurry, he's on schedule. I look up and I smile, and he smiles back, and I know he's thinking, oh, she loves me. No, I'm thinking, if you knew that your behavior was governed right now by a light, a, a tra traffic light that was invented by a black man, you'd run that light. You know huh. he would, and I know he would. Huh. I sit there and I smile at him, I think, you fool. Huh. If he knew what he puts on his heavy work boots in the morning, that he wouldn't have those if it hadn't been for a black man who invented the last so that you could have cheaply made, quickly made shoes, he'd find something else to wear or he'd come up with an invention of his own, which he won't. Because the things that we need are all there already, most of them because of the contributions made by people of color that we, we refuse to admit. Right, right. Yeah, and we don't teach in school. Um, of course not. Of course not. We have to. We have to support the myth of the rightness of whiteness. So we talk talk only about the wonderful things that white males have provided for us. Now, hopefully, schools aren't doing that anymore. But I don't see evidence that they aren't. Except yesterday, and day before yesterday, and yesterday, the day before that, I saw lots of people of different color groups, and different religions, and different gender orientations and different opinions. I saw them in the street, absolutely infuriated by mm. what the network seemed to think is a good thing to put on every half hour. It's mm. time for us to say on the networks, people need to say, if you want to see the clip of Mr. George being killed, go Google it. But we are not showing that 
on this network anymore because it looks like what we're trying to do is intimidate young black males and their mothers. It looks like what we're trying to say to them is this will this is what will happen to you if you get out of line. Now, maybe, I know most people don't see it that way. Most people are seeing it as how awful that is. We have to show how awful it is. No, we have to realize that every time you do that, you are nailing a coffin in the self-respect of people of color, particularly black men and their mothers and fathers in this country. We'd better find a better way. Right, thank you. Thank you for that. And then, uh, and then we have a man with orange hair, hmm. clearing, having the police clear the area so that he can go out in front of a church and hold the Bible upside down to demonstrate his greatness. Right now, there is a picture of Adolf Hitler standing like this, and it is almost an exact replica of what Mr. Trump did yesterday. Let me ask you a question. When you do, did this exercise with Debbie and all her classmates, your, your dear pupils, and you saw them change so quickly, in both directions how did you end i mean we have the videos and we let's put that link in there again in the sidebar but how did you end that exercise to teach them or unteach them what they had just manifested the same way we could end this exercise that we have been using based on skin color in this country i told them at the end of the day boys and girls i lied to you today blue-eyed people aren't smart at the end of the second day i didn't tell that at the end of the first day at the end of the second day, I said, boys and girls, I lied to you yesterday on Friday and today. People of, with brown eyes are no better or worse than people with blue eyes. This exercise is over. And every one of those kids started to cry, and so did I. Mm. And they all got together and hugged one another. Oh. And for the rest, if I'm telling you, I have no idea how powerful it is to mm. force a person to see the truth and then to realize that there's a cure for it. There's a cure for racism. It's called ignorance. It's called seeing people as truly human beings, your cousins. It, I have a picture of those kids hugging one another because the, not those kids, but another group, the, the, uh, a friend of mine who's a professional photographer came in and filmed when that, that group got together, the second, third group that we did it with. And they just, they just want so much to get it back together. And the day after that exercise is over, a whole new attitude appears in a classroom. Kids would not allow other people. In fact, they wouldn't allow other teachers to be ignorant. They came mm -hmm. in from recess after that and said that and the, one of the other teachers, the other third grade teachers on the playground duty, on playground duty. And they said, and they were really upset. I said, what's going on here? That other teacher doesn't do anything when we do something wrong. She doesn't do a thing about it. But when that one group does something wrong, she really gets on them. She's, she's discriminating against those kids. And somebody ought to tell her she's discriminating. I thought, I had to say, uh, I'll talk to the principal. I'll see wow. what I can do. Because wow. those kids were, their eyes were open and they recognized it when they saw it. One of those, one of my third grade students and mothers came to me in the summer and said, I want to thank you for what you've done for my daughter. I said, what do I do for your daughter? She said, my mother-in-law, mothers-in-law, you know how they are. Every time she comes to the house, she uses the N-word and I wish she would stop it. And now she has because my daughter walked up to her the last time she was in the house and she said, Grandma, we don't use that word in our house. And if you're going to keep on using it, I'm going to go outside until you go home. Now, I didn't teach that kid much about respect for her elders, but I did teach her about elders that you can respect. Mm -hmm. And you can't respect elders after you learn the truth about race and racism. You can't do it. I remember when my sister was substituting at the junior high and the English teacher came down to the down to the lunchroom and she was just in the teacher's lounge and she was just furious she said i don't know what to do and my sister said what's going on she said well i use the n-word in the classroom and one of those students said we don't use that word in this school and if you're going to keep on using it i'm going to go out in the hall until you stop she said to my sister what would you have done and my mother said my sister said well i guess i'd quit using that particular word mm -hmm. that had never occurred to that so-called teacher mm -hmm. that woman is a teacher not an educator. Right. Teachers train people. Educators mm. lead people out of ignorance. There's mm. a huge difference. Mm. My sister was an educator. That English teacher was a teacher. So Jane, we have a question. We have many questions, but we have a very popular question from the audience. Could I ask that of you? Go ahead. 
Uh, so the question is from Amanda, can you speak to the best practices families can do at home to raise children with equal respect for all? What can parents do to ensure their kids keep their minds and hearts open? Watch your mouth mm -hmm. and watch what you watch on television. Mm -hmm. We can create a society of human beings who appreciate people as they are if we stop watching things that dehumanize human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you have a, a, law, a legal system that, that has to argue about punishing, greatly punishing somebody who is proud of having his knee on another person's neck mm -hmm. and holds it there for nine minutes mm -hmm. and the networks keep on showing it and showing it and showing it, what you have to do is contact the networks and say, you do it again, you show that again, and I'm going to cut you off my television set. Because yeah. you see, what keeps racism alive in this country is capitalism. And I am a capitalist. I believe in capitalism. But I do not believe in making money on the sorrow and the pain and the agony of other human beings because of our ignorance about other human beings. Amen. You have to you change the way you behave in the, you have to change your language and the way you behave in your home. You have to talk about people as equal human, as human beings who de you deserve and who promised, who are promised equitable treatment under the law. You have to stop saying, well, was it a black guy? And when people talk about a crime that has been committed, if they say it was done by a black man, you need to call that station and say, wait a minute. It's mm -hmm. time for you to stop that. It's time for us to watch out. Uh, Marshall McLuhan told us about the danger of television a long time ago. I would yeah. suggest that everybody get a book written by Marshall McLuhan and read it, and they'll realize why television could be a force for good. Instead, it is being used as a force for evil because people believe what they see. My father used to say to us, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. Now, he would say, believe none of what you hear and none of what you see. Because I've been on television often enough to know what happens when they want that, when, when they ask you to be on a show and they tell you what they want you to say. And mm -hmm. I have turned down lots of jobs because, no, I'm not gonna say that. You want me to tell the truth? I'll tell the truth, but you'll lose some sponsors. So don't ask me to be on your show because I don't want you, you need those sponsors. And I don't need to be on your show. That being on this show is not one of my needs. You understand that? No, of course. But, but I appreciate being asked to discuss this situation. It's our in honor. In an honest manner, in, a, up for, in an honest and upfront manner. And I am not going to sugarcoat what is going on in this country. As far as I'm concerned, this is one of the finest countries on the earth. It was until three and a half years ago. Yeah. And most people worldwide admired and looked up to this country because we were trying to live, trying, we were working at living our principles. We aren't yeah. anymore. We aren't. For the last three and a half years, we haven't. And we have been encouraged not to. This is a dangerous time. The first yeah. thing you can do is talk to your kids about voting and take them with you when you go to the polls every yeah. year so that they will see you okay. voting. And then yeah. watch the polls and watch the results and then say that happened because not enough people went to the polls or that happened because a whole lot of people got angry and they aren't going to put up with this, this anymore. You have to show your children examples of real citizenship. And I don't mean citizenship that says we'll go along to get along. Mm -hmm. I mean, citizenship of the Frederick Douglass type that mm -hmm. says don't put up with that. You have the kids that were that were marching and every major city in the United States did this weekend, this week, we're doing the right thing. They mm -hmm. are saying, we will put a stop to this. And if you don't, if you don't put a stop to it, we will see to it that you are uncomfortable for the rest of your life. In as, as long as you're in that legal position, we'll see to it that you're uncomfortable and you will suffer. You won't suffer physically. We aren't going to hurt you physically. We're going to suffer. We're going to take our business away from Amazon. We're going to take our, I thought that I'd wreck that. Well, we're, it's back. You, need say, you need to say, we're going to see to it that you suffer economically. That's what's happening in this country today. And we deserve to have that happen. Mm. A woman. A woman. <laughs> see, learning has taken place here. 
Exactly. Well, we are at at noon. Uh, Jane, thank you so much. You're a delight and you're incredibly scary and um, heartbreaking. And I'm so in love with you, frankly. I think everyone else here is. And it's not about you. It's about us waking up. So please listen to her words. Please listen to our African-American brothers and sisters. Please watch. Put that. Let's put that link for Jane's work in the sidebar yet again. Thank you. Listen to me. You need to have the experience in your life of not having to look down on other people because of your ignorance about skin color. You have no idea how happy, how wonderful this country could be if we could get over racism. And that's possible. Let's do it. Hey, woman. Thank you. Jane, thank you so much. Please keep it up. And uh, you make TV or media worth watching, seeing you on Oprah and Fallon. It's the highlight of my last week, just watching you. Thank you. Do they like this hair? Oh, you're looking good. (laughs) And I buttoned up. I'll keep it buttoned up. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And it was fun. (laughs) Okay. It was was scary, but it was fun. (laughs) Okay. I love the hair. Somebody's crazy. Thank you. I'm going to turn this off now. Yeah. My grandson is coming out for lunch. Goodbye. Uh, Have a good lunch. No soup sandwich. Good evening, everyone. My name is Alan Detloff, and I'm the Dean of the Graduate College of Social Work here at the University of Houston. And tonight, I'm very excited to welcome you to our third annual Social Justice Solutions event, a conversation on race and privilege with Angela Davis and Jane Elliott. I'm also very excited to welcome you to the first of a series of events that we're going to be hosting this year to celebrate our 50th anniversary as a graduate college of social work. And before we begin tonight, I want to acknowledge the elected officials who are joining us tonight. Houston City Council Member Martha Castex Tatum. And HISD Board of Trustee Member Jolanda Jones. And I'd also like to acknowledge a member of our University of Houston System Board of Regents who's joining us tonight, Andrew Teo. And now I'd like to welcome Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and the Provost of the University of Houston, Paula Myrick Short, who is here to be welcome you. Thank you, Dean uh, Detlef. Uh, and I was just told that Durga, uh, Regent Durga Agarwal has joined us. Would you welcome him? Thank you for being here. Well, thank, uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. This is just an incredibly exciting evening with our phenomenal guests that we have here, Angela Davis and Jane Elliott. And I have to say, we are so pleased to be here for the annual student-led conversation social justice solutions series. Give our students a hand for this. And I heard all the applause for Dean Detlef when he came on the stage, and I want to tell you, he is an incredible dean. Uh, I am delighted that he decided to join the University of Houston, and he is leading our wonderful graduate College of Social Work to top ranking in the world. So I um, want to congratulate both Dean Detlef, the faculty, and particularly the students in the Graduate College of Social Work for having the foresight and the commitment and the passion to create this series to provide an opportunity to bring in activists, 
people who have a strong voice, people who can help us think, people who can bring in community and create a dialogue about critical issues that are so important to us, the issues that we value so deeply and is issues that we must discuss. So tonight, you're in for a treat. This will be uh, an incredible conversation to have with our guests. I welcome all of you here. Again, I congratulate the students one more time for making this happen. So enjoy and welcome to the University of Houston, our guests. Thank you for being here. So before we begin tonight, I wanna to take just a minute to tell you about the origins of this event and what it means to us as a College of Social Work. At the Graduate College of Social Work, our mission is to prepare students to do the work necessary to achieve social, racial, economic, and political justice for all. I tell every one of our students that when they graduate, I expect them to not only be advocates for change, but to be activists and leaders to bring about the changes necessary in our society to achieve justice. And this event began because one of our students who took on that responsibility a couple years ago, shortly after my first year as dean, summer of 2016, one of our students, Miranda Harris, came to me because she was concerned about what was becoming an epidemic of police violence in the African-American community. And she wanted to know what she could do about this and what we as a college could do to address this. And this was just shortly after the murders of Alton Sterling and Philando Castile at the hands of law enforcement. And we knew that this was something that we needed to talk about as a community of social workers, not just to educate our students about the issue, but to equip them with skills to identify solutions. So our first event was held in the fall of 2016 and focused on what we could do as a community to address police violence. But we realized that we couldn't stop the conversation after just one event. We have to continue having conversations about these critical issues and look for ways that we can all be involved to bring about change, which leads us to tonight. I have to tell you how inspiring it was to see just three days after we announced tonight's event, tickets were completely sold out, and it reaffirmed the importance of this conversation. Thanks. For us, it really affirmed how important it was for us to continue to engage in these conversations, not just here in Houston tonight, but all over the country. The response has been overwhelming. We have a packed house in here tonight and even more joining us online via our live stream. So I encourage all of you to participate, share your thoughts, your comments, your ideas using the hashtag socialjusticeuh. And now I'd like to invite our students who once again provided the inspiration for tonight's conversation, Niolas Palomo and Shinquella Williams. Good evening, my name is Nayolis Palomo. And my name is Shen Quella Williams. We would like to thank the Graduate College of Social Work, the Simmons Foundation, and the ACLU of Texas for helping us make this event possible. Race and privilege are two social constructs rooted in the history of the United States that continue to make us feel uncomfortable. These two social constructs are not only ingrained in our history, they are also at the core of institutionalized racism, racial divide, police brutality, mass incarceration, white supremacy, school discipline disproportionalities, health disparities, and a discriminatory criminal justice system. It is time to further our conversations about race and privilege before it continues to harm our brothers and sisters and deepens our segregated understandings of one humankind. As social workers, we strongly believe that in order to get to the root causes of systemic injustice, we must first fully comprehend the, all the systemic injustices that are happening in this country we must first comprehend all the different challenges the marginalized and oppressed communities experience. It is our hope that this conversation will bring awareness on how to start a dialogue on race and privilege and move to actionable steps to create change in marginalized and oppressed communities. We all have a responsibility to be positive change agents in our respective fields. This is our call to action. 
Without further ado, we would like to introduce Dr. Jean Ladin. Dr. Ladding served as a professor at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work for 37 years. Now, four years after teaching, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, four years after teaching her last class, Dr. Ladding is still championing social change, and the University of Houston continues to be a part of her life. Dr. Ladin is, is an organizational consultant and co-director of Leading Consciously, an organization dedicated to building community among those who wish to make a difference. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jean Ladin. All right, are we excited? Great. Okay, it is my, I was trying to think of the adjective, excruciating pleasure, extreme pleasure. <laughs> Let's try excruciating. It is my excruciating pleasure to introduce to you the two speakers today. Angela Davis is an... Did I tell you they were excited? <laughs> Angela Davis is an activist, scholar, and writer who advocates for the oppressed. She is Professor Emeritus of History of Consciousness and Feminist Studies at the University of California at Santa Cruz and a distinguished visiting professor in the Women and Gender Studies Department at Syracuse University. The author of five books, including the seminal Women, Race, and Class, she advocates for gender equity, prison reform, and alliances across color lines. Jane Elliott. All right, y'all, we're going to have fun tonight. <laughs> Jane Elliott is an internationally known teacher, lecturer, and diversity trainer. In response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1968, she devised the controversial and startling Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes exercise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The now famous exercise labels participants as inferior or superior based upon the color of their eyes and exposes them to the experience of being a minority. So, oh, welcome you. to both of you. Thank you. The format we're going to use is this. I'm going to, I have moderate some questions. I'm going to ask them some questions for 45 minutes. We schedule nine questions. However, based on what happened in the room before we came here, we might not get to all nine. We'll see. <laughs> we have nine questions, for, and then uh, you will be invited to come to the mic for 25 minutes to give your questions. Okay? And so with that, we shall begin. Could we turn the lights up, please? Can turn them up the so we can higher? see them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, they'd like the lights turned up so we can see people. We need, we need to know whether somebody has a gun. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I know, this is I know, 
I know I'm in Texas, y'all. Okay, so the first question is for Angela Davis, and then I'll invite commentary from Jane Elliott. Angela, on the web, you're quoted as saying, racism is a much more clandestine, much more hidden kind of phenomena, but at the same time, it's perhaps far more terrible than it's ever been. Would you explain what you meant by that and why this conversation on race and social justice is still necessary? Okay, I'm trying to remember when I said that. Uh, <laughs> it may have been 30 years ago. Uh, but do you believe but it? First of all, um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to thank the... Uh, is, is the mic working? Okay, I'd like to thank the... No? Who cannot hear? If you cannot hear, raise your hand. Okay, is this better? <laughs> all right, well, I'll hold it up to my mouth. Uh, so first of all, I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here with Jane Elliott. This is the first time I've had the opportunity to uh, meet her. <laughs> And I'm very happy that the students initiated this series on social justice. So that, um, that question regarding a comment I, I probably made during the period when um, people were talking about a post-racial America. Do you remember that? Last week. It wasn't that long ago. Uh, and I, I, I was probably responding uh, to those who were arguing that racism was something of the past, uh, that uh, with the so-called triumph of the civil rights movement, we had overcome um, racism. Uh, it may have been during the time Obama was in office, uh, because there was the assumption that the election of one black man to the White House magically eradicated you know, all of the consequences of racism and settler colonialism for the last 500 years. Um, and so the question as to whether I believe that uh, it is hidden today, yes. there are manifestations of racism uh, that are certainly overt uh, thanks um, to the person who occupies the highest rung of executive <laughs> office in this country. Yeah. Uh, but I would, I, I would say that I don't know whether we grasp the extent to which racism has affected and infected the entire history of this country. It's not a simple thing. We cannot wish it away. We cannot simply assume that by doing all kinds of trainings, and trainings are really important, and I totally appreciate the, the value of, of bringing people to consciousness about the way in which they are responsible for the perpetration and perpetuation of racism. Um, but racism is deeply ingrained in, this, in, in the economy, in the school system, in the prison system, criminal justice. Uh, um, and I would probably conclude by saying what we are addressing today are issues that should have been taken up in the immediate aftermath of slavery. <laughs> but they're also issues that should have been taken up with respect to the um, colonization of this part of the world. Uh, uh, the, the first victims of racism were indigenous people in this country. And so that means we have a lot of work ahead of us. Right. Okay. Jane, you want to comment? You want me to comment? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> sure do. You don't really want me to comment because I'm really angry. 
I want you folks to do something. I want every white person, every person in this room, who considers himself or herself a member of the white race to stand right now. Right now. Every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the white race. Now, remain standing. Now, remain standing. Now, will every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the black race please stand? <coughs> up, 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 up. And remain standing. Now, the brown race. Anybody who considers himself or herself a member of the brown race. Now, the yellow race. Now, the red race. Now, will ev look around you people. Practically everybody is standing. Now, will every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the human race please sit down? <laughs> Now, people, you are all members of the same race, the human race, which started with black women between 300,000. This, this, don't interrupt me, I don't have much time. Now, <laughs> white folks, you don't like it, but all you are is faded blacks. That's the way it is. Every one of you, if you take your trace your DNA back far enough, you're going to find that some of your DNA came from Africa because we all have the same ancestor back there, every single one of us. And those of you who think you don't have are obviously from outer space. <laughs> now, that means that every one of us is a 30th to 50th cousin to every other person in this room. So I want you to turn to the person on your left or your right or behind or in front of you, stick out your hand and say, hi, cousin. Hi, cousin. Now, oh, uh, uh, now, will every person in this room who considers himself or herself a biracial person stand. Don't you stand. <laughs> Don't you stand. <laughs> People, we have to get rid of the language of racism. Words are important, people. Words matter. You have to be careful how you use them, and you have to refuse to tolerate these ugly words being used in your presence. Now, make no mistake about this. I've been de described as a teacher. I'm not a teacher. Teachers dispense facts and figures so that they can get their kids ready for the end of school testing. I've been called a trainer. You train dogs and horses and members of the mil military. You, I don't train people. I'm an educator. The word educator, I'm an... I don't want to be interrupted anymore. <laughs> People, the word educator comes from the root duck deuce, which means lead, the prefix e, which means out, the suffix ate, which means the act of, and the suffix or, which means one who does. An educator is one who is engaged in the act of leading people out of ignorance. <laughs> now, in this, in this country, we spend a lot of money on what we call education. It isn't education, it's indoctrination. It takes us 13 years to teach a student, to educate a student, to be ignorant about race and to support ideas that make this a better country. This is a word for this in my vernacular, since I was raised on a farm, is bullshit. <laughs> Don't write that down. People, I recognize it when I see it, and that's what we're living with right now. If we weren't in a, if we were in a, if we were in post-racial society, Donosaurus T. Rump would not be in the White House. He he got elected because white people resented having a black man in the White House for eight years. It's time to face the truth and say the truth, and it's time for women, all women, and all people of color to stop playing defense and defending what they are and go on the offense. We were here first. We don't have to apologize for what we are or for what we do. Now, I know some of you are thinking, boy, this well, is she a bitch? Yes, I am. <laughs>
Now, how many of you women have been called the B word? Look around, fellas. Everybody's heard it. Come up with a new word. Now, how, how many of you are called that by a male? All right. People, for me, the B word is an acronym for being in total control, honey. <laughs> and when women are seen in control, the men around them call them the B word. You need to say, you're right, darling, I am. And then you need to whip out your little Lorena Bobbitt fruit knife. <laughs> now, don't do that, because some of these boys are scared to death. Now some of you are thinking, she doesn't like men. Oh, God, do I like men. Oh, mm, mm, mm. Find me one, please, please. <laughs> some of my best friends are men. I was married to one for 59 years. When I married him, he looked just like Marlon Brando. He really did. When he died, he looked like Tellus of Alice. Live with me for 59 years. Now, what's your next question? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Education so, should be fun. <laughs> I'm already cutting out questions. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about privilege. Mm. Angela, you want to talk about privilege? The first, and this goes to you, Jane, first. How did you first become aware? This is a reflective question. How did you first become aware of your own privilege? And how did you first become aware that others had more privilege than you? And I'm going to ask the same of you also. Oh, so, you want me yeah, to go yes, first? so you go first. I never thought of it as white privilege. I just thought if you do the right thing, people will do the right thing where you're concerned. And because I'm white, they did. And they were wrong. Because I've been doing the wrong thing for about, well, for about 33 years, I did the wrong thing. I thought I was all right. And then I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise. And I watched a brilliant little blue-eyed white girl turn into a frightened, intimidated, unable to learn child in the space of 15 minutes because I accused her of not being smart enough because she had the wrong color eyes. And I watched four dyslexic brown-eyed boys read words they had never been able to read and spell words they had never been able to spell because nobody had ever told them that they could learn to read or spell. But on the day they had brown eyes, it was obvious, it was obvious that the world was theirs. They could do anything. I found out about expectations that day, and I realized that what we have done, what we white folks have done in this country, ever since we got here, is treat people positively or negatively, not on the basis of the color of their skin, but on the basis of our ignorance about skin color, where it comes from and what it causes. This is not about skin color, this is about ignorance. And the answer to ignorance is education. It is not indoctrination. It is not schooling, it is not training, it is education. But you have to have teachers who know better if they're going to teach better. And teachers can only teach what they know. And unfortunately for all of us, we've all been led down the same ugly path of thinking that it's all right to claim privilege when what we should be claiming is ignorance. We've got the wrong, we've got the wrong word here, people. This problem is white ignorance. And white people are running the show. Now you said you're going to think she, she's, a, she's a traitor to her race. I'm not a traitor to the human race, and that's the only race I see. Make no mistake about that. And as long as we start acting, as long as we keep on acting as though there are several races, we can have panels like this at which we discuss white privilege instead of discussing white ignorance and deciding to do something about it. We need to start really furnishing education in these schools instead of furnishing indoctrination. Did that answer your question? Yes, partially. All right. The rest of the question is, so how did you become aware of your own privilege or of others having more privilege than you? You're talking about... I watched my students. It was watching the and students. I realized watching them that they were exhibiting the behaviors that they were copying from me. They acted ah. the... Hey, 
my little brown-eyed students, the day they were on the top in that exercise, became me. And it made me sick to my stomach, and it does to this day. I hate, I hate to remember that day, because I watched my brown-eyed children, who would, we just loved one another in my classroom. We really did. And on that day, I found out that I don't want to be tolerated. Because in that classroom, my kids tolerated me, because I'm blue-eyed. The first thing that was said after I told the kids that blue-eyed people aren't as smart as brown-eyed people, little blue-eyed, a little brown-eyed child in the white row, in the front row, Debbie Hughes, looked up at me and said, how come you're the teacher here if you got them blue eyes? (laughs) I got a real experience that day and a real educational experience, people. I found out how I look to people of color. And I have spent the last 50 years trying not to look like that and trying to encourage others to stop it. Tell you another thing. Do I have a few more minutes here? My father, at the age of 60, watched the film that the CBC made in my classroom the second year I did the exercise. They sent me a copy of it, and I showed it to my father and my mother. My father was 60 years old, the most honest man, the most moral man I have ever known. I showed him that film. When it was over, he stood up, and in his bib overalls and his blue chambray shirt rolled up to the elbows, He reached in his back pocket, took out his red handkerchief, and with tears in his eyes, he blew his nose and said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. You can criticize what I do until the cows come home. And psychologists do until they get smart. I don't listen anymore because my father said, I wish somebody had taught me that when I was nine years old. If somebody had taught my father that when he was nine years old, we would never have had to listen to some of the ridiculous racist remarks that he made. And he never made them again after he watched that film. Don't tell me that you can't change people. Don't tell me that you're too old to change. There isn't a person in this room who is too old to change. White folks, you got to change. Because within 30 years, you will be a numerical minority in the United States of America. And you had better prove, pray, pray to whoever you pray for, to or for that people of color are not going to get even with us and treat us the way we have treated them. If you, can't think of, if you can't think of any other reason for treating people like equal human beings, think of that one. Because what you do today is creating the future. I don't think you want the kind of future that you have provided for people in the present. I may be mistaken. You may not know what's going on. You know what's going on. And if I asked you, if every white, well, every white person in this room who wants to be treated the way we have treated people of color in this, in this country, if you'd like to be treated that way, all you white folks, if you want that for the rest of your life, please stand. Did you understand the directions? <laughs> if you're white and you think blacks have got it so good in this country and you want to be treated the way they have been for the rest of your life, just stand up. You know why you aren't standing. You know it's ugly, and you know it's happening, and you know you don't want it to happen to you. So I want to know why you're so willing to allow it for others in this post-racial society. Can I have a question? Okay, so we're talking about privilege and how you first became aware that others had more privilege than you and how you might have been aware that you had more privilege than others? Okay, first of all, I think um, it is important to emphasize the notion of privilege, but privilege, as Jane pointed out, can't explain the workings of racism altogether. Okay, so make that distinction. That's really important. Well, do you want me to tell you when I first became aware of racism? Yes, yes. (laughs) Um, I had the, I don't know whether I would say good fortune or bad fortune, of growing up in the most segregated city in the United States of America during the 1940s and the 1950s, Birmingham, Mm -hmm. Alabama. Mm -hmm. And so I can't really tell you when I became aware of racism. I think that as I learned to think and learned to conceptualize, racism was always in in, in the forefront. 
I can tell you that I remember when I was about two years old, I was, um, I was washing my shoelaces, my white shoelaces, uh, uh, because uh, I, I was going to wear them to Sunday school the next day, the Saturday evening. And then suddenly uh, I heard this um, uh, uh, sound, this, 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 this thunderous sound, as it turned out, the house across the the street was being bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, because I lived in an area of Birmingham that uh, was right on the edge of the zone um, that had been created for black people. So we were able to live on one side of the street, white people on the other side of the street. When black people bought um, a house on the other side of the street, it was bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. But, but let me say something parenthetically here, because you might, you might ask, well, how is it that black people were able to buy a house in the white neighborhood? Uh, because, of course, white people would have to sell it to them. Um, it was because white people bought the house White people who were involved in the anti-racist movement. Big Sam presents. I make this for you.